We are more than just a college. Some say that we thrive off of challenges and failures, but we still have more room than ever to improve. In order to become the greatest of all time, we stick together and execute what needs to be done. We are more than just a college. We are a university. It begins from within. Navajo Technical University Culinary Arts Program, Baking, and Hotel Restaurant Administration Program. We provide our students with as many marketable skills as possible. We will cover everything from food safety and sanitation, all the way up to classes such as hospitality law for the bachelor's program. I've been here at Yank, but I've been at my TC for five years now. Uh, competition, I'm doing chess, archery, and having that at the uh, powwow. We're tuning in here live at the Poetry Slam here at AHEC, live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. First Poetry Slam in AHEC Consortium since prior to COVID. 2019 was our last one. So tonight, we got over 37 tribal colleges that are going to be participating. Hello, my relatives, my friends. My name is Shannon Christy Hooper. I'm a Paiute Shoshone from Fallon, Nevada, and I am your current reigning Miss AHEC 2019-2023. I represent the AHEC organization, 37 tribal colleges and universities throughout the United States, including all Native American scholars.
You can design your, your arrow to go beyond 50 feet. I want you to look at the arrow all the way down. When I make my, my students shoot, we try to look at the arrow. We study the arrow. everyone. We're going to get started. This is, uh, of course, the last final day. It's, uh, in my view, the best day. I know many of you uh, have had a tremendous experience. I want to, first of all, before I introduce myself and, and our panel, uh, bring attention to the uh, chairs that we have up front. And we want as many of you 
uh, to come up front. And uh, this is, uh, and, and, and you know, take advantage of the chairs that are really close. So no need to be way back there when we have all this, these nice ways. You can join Dr. Robert Martin. <laughs> uh, at any rate, so we're going to get started. Um, my name is Martin Miguel Almada. Um, I am the uh, president of San Carlos Apache College. It is the youngest, the newest tribal college in, in the country. We're very proud. We've been around for five and a half years. And uh, we've had three graduating classes already. So we're very proud of that achievement. And for our uh, uh, students who are here, uh, they are making history because they are the first student group from our college to ever participate in the AHEC annual event. We take a lot of pride in that. So let me, you know, and, and I have been able to attend your competitions, and I'm so darn proud of you. Oh, my gosh. And you know, it's, and I, I know the other TCU presidents share this with me, where sometimes it's events like this that enable us to get to know some of our students better. And that's one of the things I appreciate of, the, of our students that are, who have been here. I have really gotten to know you well. What a gift that is. And so I want to shout out very quickly. Thank you, uh, Billy, uh, Viviana, uh, Theodore, Paige, Artie, Angelisa, and uh, Juliana. So proud of you for, for uh, you know, representing us. I also wanted to acknowledge very quickly um, the uh, other seven TCU presidents who were my peers uh, in the planning of this event. This was really a lot of hard work. There were eight of us, eight TCUs uh, and, and the presidents. We spent a lot of time, not only once, but twice, as it was mentioned before. Uh, we started in 2019 right here in Albuquerque at this very uh, conference center. And it's so neat to know that several years later, this has come to fruition. But a lot of work went into that. And I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Martin in particular because he kept us in line. He was really the leader among, among the, the TCU presidents, making sure that we you know, had uh, meetings on a, a regular basis. He, sent us, he, uh, he assigned note takers, he, uh, you know, and he had agendas, and he ran most of the meetings. And thank you, sir, for your tremendous leadership. Um, I also wanted to do very quickly, because we have quite a bit to cover in a really short amount of time, give thanks to TOCC our accreditation aegis, and to their wonderful president, Paul Robertson. They have been partners. If it weren't for them serving as the accreditation aegis, our uh, young uh, you know, TCU wouldn't be where it is today. So we're really grateful to TOCC. We are also, I also want to you know, thank uh, the, um, the, the staff of, my, of, of our college that worked their butts off. And we were the ones that hosted the speech competition. And uh, it's been very popular. I mean, we even had people on standby for a slot. Uh, I want to acknowledge, you know, the uh, uh, provost, uh, Lisa Yutzi, who really took the lead and, 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 and oversaw all of that, including designing and being the chair. Um, and her two key, uh, uh, Nikki and Tia, thank you for helping her with everything, including manning the booth, womanizing the booth, womaning the booth. We should, we, should, we should be more sensitive about these things. I don't know. At any rate, and uh, our two faculty members who came, Mark and Jim, and uh, Kathy, of course, who you will be hearing very soon, um, and, uh, and Tim. Thank you, Tim. Those are, that group, um, you know, uh, again, we're making history. This is our first event, and they've worked really hard to make sure that we held our, we did our part. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that the vice chair of our board, Dorina Thompson, made the trip. So we had it you know, an officer of our board here all the time, and that is really special. Um, I want to do, I want to thank um, AHEC. I think we need to remember that this is her 50th anniversary, and uh, Carrie Billy, my God, the uh, leadership she has provided for decades. Woo, my goodness. As the, you know, the unifying voice, the advocates for all TCUs. And uh, uh, Carrie, we could never thank you enough for everything you've done for, for this organization and for all TCUs and your staff. You're, you're, you're amazing. You know, I, I also wanted to thank Carmen Hennen and uh, uh, Candice Mendes, who really were the main uh, workers behind the scenes to bring everything together for this event. Um, a lot of work. You, you wouldn't believe all that is involved in that. Even this morning, uh, they were bringing us coffee and burros, and you can go on and on. Unbelievable. Thank you, Carmen and Candice, for that. Um, I, I want to point out that... Uh, you know, I had the privilege, and I know that the other TCU presidents who are here have also had the privilege to meet students from the other TCUs. 
And it's often neat when you don't have your badge, they don't know who you are, and they approach you as you were just a fellow student, an older one, an uglier, an older one, but still a student, right? <laughs> and uh, I've had the opportunity to spend several hours with uh, groups of students from other TCUs getting to know their dreams, their goals, their apprehensions, and it was just powerful. And I want to say to you, this conference is about you and for you. We're here just to support, but this is your conference. And I know you're going to uh, be prepared to come back next year with a lot of ambition and gusto and revenge, saying, I'm not going to lose next time. No second place for me. You know, that is wonderful, but this is for you. And if you were at a traditional university, you wouldn't be able to take part in something this special, a national competition where you're able to really, you know, get to uh, uh, demonstrate the skills and knowledge that, you, that you're acquiring at your TCUs. We have 37 TCUs, 37 realities. Look at all the languages, all the creation stories, all the wonderful dreams that are represented in this group. Uh, well, among the students that I met, I got to say, there was one that really touched my heart yesterday as I was leaving, who was feeling all alone and wasn't sure, you know, a little apprehensive about what am I doing here? And I got to say that that, that young man from uh, the College of Muskogee Nation really impressed me. You have dreams about photography, and be in filmmaking, follow those dreams. That's what this is all about, is to remind you that you know, we're all here for you to make all of your goals and your dreams come true. And uh, for the, uh, you know, the, the uh, workshop boys from, the, from Haskell, I wanted to say to you, I enjoyed my talks with you, thank you, and then all the other students I had from other TCUs that I had an opportunity to meet, I really appreciated that. At any rate, enough with that, we'll have, um, 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 I, I did wanna point out that uh, Dr. Martin has informed us that we have, I think, 1,086 of registrants for this conference. That's amazing. That's really good. And of course, there's an additional 200 uh, that's comprised of volunteers and others. So this, you know, we've had a good, very good uh, showing. Um, let me now move over to introduce our invocation leader, someone that I happen to know very well and for whom I have a very special place in my heart, a lot of admiration, the one and only Kathy, Kathy Wesley Kichion, who will be giving us the prayer for the morning. Uh, we were very lucky that as we opened our college, one of the first people that whom we hired was, was, was Kathy to be the founding uh, chair of our, our Department of Apache Language, Culture, and History. Um, let me just say a little bit about her. She is a pioneer. She's really special. Um, uh, her role, again, is to lead our college's historic role in work of preserving and revitalizing the Apache language, history, and culture. Professor Wesley Kichion brings to SCAC our college, a rich educational background, plus a wealth of professional experiences and expertise in the arenas of education, health, government, nonprofit management, and social services. She earned her higher education degrees from Northern Arizona University, including a bachelor's of science, a master's degree in multicultural education, and yet another master's degree in educational leadership. Professor Kichian was the first and only to this day, the only chairwoman of the almighty San Carlos Apache tribe. Talk about woman power, woman power. Never underestimate, right, the transformative power of native women and their grace and their strength and, and so on. Um, I'm very proud of her for that. She has also been the vice president of the Intertribal Council of Arizona, the Southwest representative of the National Congress of American Indians. She has been the president of the Sangha Izandi. I know she's going to make fun of me for how I butchered that association. And a member of the National Indian uh, Health uh, Board. She served as a highly regarded, and to this day I run into people that, are full, that she was her main teacher and she was tough and she got them going in their lives and their careers. So she is uh, revered by many generations of individuals who were her students when she was a teacher and a principal at San Carlos High School. And she has been the executive director of the Department of Health and Human Services, one thing not listed in her bio sketch. She serves on the board of the uh, San Carlos Apache Health Corporation, which has, I think, distinguished itself as the premier hospital health corporation in all of Indian country in the United States. Really amazing. Uh, Kathy, without any more delay, please come up and give us a blessing. Thank you for being here for us. I wonder who paid him. <laughs> oh, will you please join me in the blessed on this morning? I'd appreciate it. Um, and I am going to pray in my Apache language. <laughs> 
Thank you, Professor Kichian. Let her prayer and the prayers of your ancestors carry you through the rest of this conference and through the rest of your career and all the wonderful dreams you're going to be pursuing. We've been blessed by a special lady. And so go forward with the rest of what you're doing, knowing that there are these kinds of powerful prayers sustaining you and carrying you. I want to now uh, introduce our next person, on, uh, someone that probably doesn't need any introduction. Many of you already know about her, and, uh, but it's a real privilege to be able to present this national treasure to you who is going to uh, be reading some poetry for us, Ms. Lucy Tapahanso who is a professor emerita of English literature with the University of New Mexico and has served as the inaugural poet laureate of the Navajo Nation. She has published three children's books and six award-winning books of poetry. Recent literary recognitions include uh, the uh, 2021 Ostana, which is of Italy, International Prize, which honors authors who write in their mother tongue. Her keynote address at the fifth annual Taos Writers' Conferences uh, and, uh, and her 2022 Distinguished Literary Achievement Award by the Western Literature Association. In 2022, uh, 2020, uh, Ms. Tapahanso was an artist in the Residence Fellow in Bosque Redondo Fort Summer Memorial Museum and recorded a poem for Living Nations, Living Words, a map of First Peoples poetry for the U.S. Library of Congress. Her poems were published in When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. Isn't that beautiful? What? 
You got to buy that and get her, get her to sign that. And the Diné Reader. Tapahanso's poems were also featured on The Slow Down with Tracy K. Smith and Poem A Day. She also wrote the script for Creating Tradition, Innovation and Change in American Indian Art exhi Exhibition at Walt, at Walt Disney's World Epcot in Florida. Professor uh, Tapahanso has presented at various institutions of higher learning, including Harvard University, the uh, Basili International Literature Festival in the P Republic of Georgia, and at the University of New Zealand at Auckland and Wellington. It is a pleasure to now introduce to you this gem in our world, Lucy Tapahanso. I'm going to read four poems for you in keeping with the Navajo tradition. They always say, everything we do is um, better when we keep um, the number four in mind. So this is the first one. The beginning was missed. The first holy ones talked and sang as always. They created light, night, and day. They sang into place the mountains, the rivers, plants, and animals. They sang us into life. And then I'm going to read this poem, which is based on um, a Navajo social song. I really like uh, to write poetry and incorporate Na um, Navajo into the poems and then also incorporate songs. So this one's called Far Away. Some of you may remember um, Vincent Gregg. So Rita appears in the first section. Rita was at the trading post waiting to have her check approved. She, moved, she stood over to the side while people moved through the cashier's line. Then this guy came over after buying a bottle of Joy detergent. <coughs> he said, smiling, it's really sad to be alone, I found out. That's why I'm buying this, to wash my dishes alone. Rita was so surprised, she just said, oh, after he went out, the cashier said, hey, is that all you can say? Rita and everyone in line laugh. When Rita came out of the trading post, that guy with the joy was gone. Where trading post at? Where trading post at? She got an away, hey, 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 hey. Far away, far away, yay, 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 she got an ishne, away, hey, 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 hey. The traffic is awful at Shiprock Fair. You have to park on Friday night to get a decent spot for the parade. Most families have a traditional spot and every year relatives and friends look for them there. Sometimes we sell coffee and pop from the back of the pickup, but usually we drink all the coffee ourselves and forget to pay. The kids get so excited and try to dance with all the dance groups that come by. They catch candy from the various floats. 
Hours later, when it's all over, they're sweaty, sticky with candy, and grouchy. So we pack up the chairs, blankets, bags of candy, and free stuff, and ease into the long lines of traffic. No matter where we want to go, it's slow going. It's easier if the traffic officer is a relative, then you can say, Shawe, my baby, let me in. Then they'll stop cars and let you break into line. Once in traffic, once in traffic, my a friend said, Shiprock Fair is not the only one, you know. Tuba City Fair is better than this. We just all looked at her and thought, where to Basidi? Where to Basidi? She got in a snare away, hey, 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 far away, far away, hey, 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 she got in a snare away, hey, 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 hey. When we were children, my mother always sat beside daddy as he drove. He would open the door for her and help her in. Daddy had a dog named Sandwich that he really liked. Sandwich followed him everywhere, and sometimes he sat on the passenger side when he and Daddy went places alone. Then one day, Sandwich leapt in before Mom and sat beside Daddy. After that happened three times, Mom said, I'm not going anywhere with you if that dog sits in the middle. Daddy just smiled and fixed Sandwich a special place in the back of the pickup. Later, Mom got in, looked around, and said, Where's that old dog? Where that old sandwich? Where that old sandwich? She got in a snail away, ya, hey, ya, 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 far away, far away, ya, 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 she got in a snail away, ya, hey, ya, 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 ya. For once, they went dancing in Albuquerque. It was perfect not too smoky, a live band, playing smooth, uncrowded dance floor, attentive waiters. Best of all, the Yona's husband was a good dancer. They danced to almost every song except after fast swing numbers when they caught their breath and sipped cold drinks. One night after he went to the men's room, the band started playing check yes or no. Oh, shoot, my favorite song, Leona thought. Just then, an open hand appeared requesting a dance. She glanced up and saw that it belonged to a tall cowboy. Please, he said, smiling. No, thank you, Leona said. All of a sudden, he fell to one knee and said, just one dance, I'm begging you. Then he took his hat and pretended to clear a wide path to the dance floor. She just smiled. Then he leaned over and whispered, remember, you broke my heart, and laughed. Why break his heart now? Why break his heart now? She got in a snail away, ya, hey, 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 ya, far away, far away, hey, 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 she got in a snail away, ya, hey, 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 ya, far away, far away, hey, 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 she got in a snail. Away, uh, hey, 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 uh, hey, uh. <laughs> this is a poem called This Morning, and it's one that's not published. 
The screech of the recycling truck jolted me awake. It was just after dawn and the huge trucks were already tearing through the neighborhood, streaking brakes keeping rhythm with shattering glass and clinking cans amid barking dogs. I panicked, then remembered the bins were out. The little dogs shot out of the room, their tiny bodies quivering with excitement and pent up barking. Before this moment, I dreamt of Shema, my mother. She slept under a calico quilt made with squares of tiny purple and yellow flowers. She made our clothes from such fabric when we were children. In my dream, I covered her carefully and patted her sleeping shoulder. Her breathing was soft and labored. I smoothed her hair and caressed her forehead. I sat at the foot of the bed and listened to her slumber. Her breathing evened out as the dream filament settled around us. Perhaps as she slept, she relived the old Fort Wingate boarding school days. Or maybe she and my father converse as an all, decade, all those de decades pass. Maybe she relived everyday events, cooking meals, soothing children, or visiting with relatives at the kitchen table. In the final weeks of her life, I could not fathom her dreams or waking thoughts. But in this morning dream, Shema and I were joined by our quiet breathing and lingering gestures. In this dream, my, my mother and I were alone and silent. We were alone and silent. Soon the flurry of the recycling truck faded and the usual morning calm return. The sleek little dogs came back to bed, panting from a job well done. They licked my arm in unison. I said, Biga Njun, praise for a job well done. They fell asleep instantly, sinking into deep borderline snoring. Outside the bedroom window, the morning was bright and still, save for the cool breezes and calling of birds. Their innate songs encircled the quiet houses and scattered cacti. Down the street, garage doors slid shut as neighbors maneuvered out of curved driveways to begin the workday. Just then, I returned I long to return to this first dream of Shema. I long for the serene space she created. Now I knew she could do so even in dreams. How I yearned to make coffee for her one more time, to cook breakfast, boil eggs, black coffee, and fried potatoes. In her final weeks, my sisters and I fed her, spoon by spoonful. She would smile as we recounted childhood memories, listening, then talking, murmuring, and remembering. Now, as the morning sunlight sweeps through the house, I put on coffee, go outside to stretch and pray. The holy people had already passed through, yet fulfilled my yearning to be with my mother. They reassured me that she and other loved ones are with them, and they exist in an ark of quiet solace. The holy ones grace me with a glimpse of our future together, the dream a reprieve from the seemingly lonely, bereft present. And then this one, um, 
I was saying earlier that I like to uh, combine different literary forms, both Navajo um, forms and um, English and Western poetic form. And because uh, a lot of our prayers and our songs and stories are rhythmic, um, it's really, um, really not that hard to do. So this poem I'm going to read you is called Sestina, and it's a, it's a French form that uses uh, six stanzas, and then it has uses six words. It repeats them at the end of the lines. And then the last stanza is um, a tercet, which means it's three lines. Three of the six words are in the middle, and then three are at the end at the end, so it ends with an envoy, which means like you send it out into the world. So this one's, um, I, this is my favorite form, and this is called Tzili. I won't tell you what it means till the, you'll find out. Tzili. Sometimes this guy just makes me laugh, just as easily he can make me see red, like when he tries to take off as if he thirsts for freedom. Actually, he needs me like a dog needs a pack. Besides, he loves my crew cab truck. When he first noticed my jewelry, I became the woman for him. Not only that, but because I'm a Dene woman, his life revolves around me. Now he recognizes my laugh from a distance. Some evenings we go for rides in the truck down winding river road as the sky fills with purple and red streaks. To the south, people walk along the Rialto, their dogs' noses bent to the ground. The dogs are excited and thirsty. A Diet Coke is enough to quench my thirst. In the southwest, the quintessential pleasures for women are a faithful car, good music, and good stories. We're not dogged by having to drive hundreds of miles. We just reminisce, laugh, and sometimes sing. During trips north to Shiprock, dust turns everything red as the vast Salt River Canyon welcomes my truck. It is as we used to say, we keep on trucking through whatever may come our way. Our thirst for stories and laughter never ceases. Once I read that animals make life complete, but a woman like me needs more than that, I thought and laughed. Then I remembered the cats, rabbits, chickens, and dogs of my childhood. How Lobo, Snazzy, and Oki didn't seem like dogs. They listen ever alert while laying, lying under daddy's truck. They probably never really slept. Sometimes they even seemed to laugh when we spoke English. But back to this other guy, he thirsts to be near me, even when I'm driving. Move over, I say. A woman needs space and no distractions. Sit on your side before red lights come flashing. I'll be handcuffed and read my rights and you won't even care. Act like a dog and look out the window, I score. He knows when a woman need, means business. He moves slowly over to the passenger side door and looks at me, his dark, shiny eyes thirsty for affection. He gets the same look when I laugh unexpectedly, and he doesn't laugh when I talk English like those res dogs. But those, red, but those dogs instilled in me a thirst for a sleek little dog a Tzili, who loves trucks and lives only to make his mom a happy woman. <laughs> Thank you. 
and I'll end with this one. Um, so it's Lily's like little dogs. They're the only dogs we allow into our house. Like the, the one I'm writing about is about Max. He was a miniature pincher. Max and Buddy were miniature pinchers, and now we have a Chihuahua. Her name's Lupita. <laughs> so I'll end with this one. We must remember the worlds our ancestors traveled. Always wear the songs they gave us. Remember, we are made of prayers. Now we leave wrapped in old blankets of love and wisdom. Thank you. Okay, hey, Mr. Pahanso. <clears throat> that was beautiful, wasn't it? You and I hope you can appreciate what you received. I mean, I, me sitting between uh, Kathy Kichian and, Lu and Lucy Tapahanso, I, I get these chills. You know, I was like, how did this old res dog get so lucky? At any rate, now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, fabulous individual. Um, I, before I do, I want to acknowledge that. Um, Kerry Billy, president of AHEC, uh, sent out names to us, the, the presidents who were planning this event, of individuals who wanted to uh, speak at this event. And what drew my attention immediately was this particular presentation, this particular individual with USAID. And I want to say this very quickly, as, and I hope that my peers, my other you know, partners that are TCU presidents share this with us. You know, we have a very complicated mission, very complex mission as TCUs. We do more than any other institution of higher learning. Um, we do everything everybody else does and then a lot more, right, Dr. Martin? <laughs> and, uh, um, and, but I always say that at the core, we have like, you know, two, a twofold mission on the one hand, we are anchoring all of our students in their native identity, whether it's Navajo, Cherokee, Apache, et cetera, anchoring them in their identity, their culture, their language, their values, their philosophy. Uh, we're also preparing them for the jobs of the future, <clears throat> preparing them to be able to transfer to continue their studies at other institutions at higher levels. All of that is great, right? And that's critical to the core mission. At the same time, we're preparing them to be global citizens, to be active citizens anywhere in the world, self-determination, that they can go anywhere they want in the world and do whatever they want. What a complex but beautiful mission. And so USAID is important to us because it's one of the best agencies that provides opportunities, as you will learn, for our students to go to other countries of the world, to experience other cultures, and to leave a piece of themselves there, to be able to influence a lot of the individuals in other countries about their beautiful traditions and values and experiences. At any rate, so that was, I wanted to make sure I noted that as a context as to why USAID was uh, particularly important as one of the agencies we wanted to be able to uh, share with our students, and I hope you will take advantage of the amazing opportunities for you as students. Dr. Clifton Kennan, let me get my, my glasses, a little, one of the, uh, oh, apologize for that. Most people don't wear their glasses because they're very vain. I try not to use them because I look better without them at any rate. <clears throat> Dr. Clifton Kennedy Jr. is the ranking civil servant for the office of the chief DEIA officer at the United States uh, um, Agency for International Development. Dr. Kennan is a research scientist and nurse by training with international expertise in racism, lactation, and community self-determination. Before coming to USAID, he worked for the Forgive me because I'm going back and forth with this. It's a new, it's an update. Thank you for providing me an update biosketch. He worked for the Indian Health Service and lived in South and North Dakota specifically. <clears throat> He's a graduate and a product. <clears throat> Oops. I'll need your help, Dr. Kenan, getting this back. Okay, very quickly. Just tell this. Okay. I'll, I'll turn it over here. Okay. He's going to continue with this, uh, that, but I want to I want to make sure that all of you are aware that you know his experiences are so relevant to our TCUs, and he'll be speaking to the rest of you uh, of, of you throughout the day and his team 
about the opportunities that you will have uh, as TCU students to, to partake of the uh, of USAID opportunities. Dr. Kennan, if you would be so kind as to continue with your beautiful story and all that you have you have to offer. Really appreciate it. Give My this brother. man a hand. <laughs> this would be a laugh then, right? Right? <laughs> a whole update bio sketch. But that's okay. It did my best. And TCU I presidents it. can do anything. You can do anything. And you want to see what the TCU women presidents are doing. Absolutely. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about women and how they've guided my life. Uh, my name is Clifton Keenan. I work at the United States Agency for International Development. And it's my honor to be here as a servant to the American people. Certainly want to give honor to the elders. Our scholars that are here and residents, thank you for your service and commitment to your communities and to our nation. Today, I would like to talk with you briefly about a subject that's very important to me. And I've named the talk today, Reaping the Harvest My Ancestors Sowed for Me. Reaping the harvest my ancestors sowed for me. And that's important because throughout my life, and I'm 35 years old today, I have lived and been guided by what my ancestors sowed into my life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today because I don't have a traditional story to going forth and becoming the ranking civil servant in the world's premier development agency. Because I, just like many of you, come from a community where one traffic light illuminated the darkness, and that was the extent of the light we had at night. I am a rural American, and my family lives today on the same land that they overcame slavery on. See, we got to get this busy. Maybe I should stop moving. Tell me what to do, right? You know, nurses will push the limit on everything. All right, we got to get the buzzing under control. I apologize. Help someone, please. I'll go to the podium, or maybe it's okay. All right, are we good? All right, so as I was saying, I grew up in a community of just a couple of hundred people. And when I finished high school, I was awarded seven full academic scholarships to go to seven universities. And I became the person that resisted what everyone thought I should do. And I chose to go to community college simply because I knew I was not ready to leave home. And I'm going to tell you, I was criticized left and right for being someone who rejected seven full scholarship offers. But I want to tell you today that going to school in my own community and continuing to grow up with my own people was one of the greatest decisions that I ever made in my life. And when I finished community college, I became a registered nurse at the age of 19. I immediately went to serve in my home community. And when I decided I would go on to receive a baccalaureate and a graduate degree, I went to a historically black university. Because despite everything I knew, I knew that the quality of education and the opportunity to learn the African-American story and to learn about my ancestors, some of which overcame slavery and the Trail of Tears, was an education that would never be second to anything else in the nation. Whether you go to Harvard, whether you go to Yale, whether you go to Hopkins, I went to community college and I went to an HBCU and I'm sitting in the same room leading the same decisions as people that went to those other schools. And for that, you should be proud of the decision that you've made every single day. When I was a young nurse and trying to determine how I was going to make an impact into the world, there was a lovely lady who worked at the hospital that I worked at. She was a cook. She didn't complete high school. 
She was struggling and she was working two jobs and she pulled me aside one day at breakfast and said, you're going to change the world because I believe that you can do it and that's all that matters. My first lesson today in reaping the harvest that my ancestors sowed for me is each and every one of us needs to have a hero that comes from your local community. And that hero needs to be an everyday person. And for me, my hero is the lady who cooked biscuits in our local hospital who didn't graduate high school but gave her life to creating dreams that other people could pursue because opportunity came full circle for our generation when it didn't come to their ancestors. Create and find a local hero to believe in and make sure they're an everyday person. When I finished school, I was awarded a full scholarship to go to graduate school, and yet I was still living at home. Who would not live at home when you have food and laundry and you have all of the things that don't require you to face life full force? And one day I got a call from a dear friend of mine, another one of my heroes, who's from the three affiliated nation in North Dakota, and she said, I heard you speak at a conference. Would you want to come work for the Indian Health Service? I was 22 years old, and it was a leadership position. I was not qualified, at least I didn't think so, nor did I feel like I had anything to offer. And I remember Mary Lynn saying, when you come to South Dakota, you will know whether you need to be here or not. And I got on a plane and I got to South Dakota. It was so cold when I got off the plane, I got back on the plane. <laughs> TSA said, you can't get back on the plane once you get off. I said, I cannot get off the plane, it's too cold. I will tell you at the age of 22, Mary Lynn, a woman from the plains of North Dakota, sat me down and said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to change healthcare, and I'm gonna take a risk on you. Won't you take a risk on me? Mary Lynn, a woman who was of tremendous principle, created opportunity for an everyday person who many would have looked over and gave him a leadership position. And she said to me that day, if you have come here to help Indians get back on the plane, but if you've come here to serve the people here who deserve to be served, get ready for the greatest ride of your life. My second and third lessons today, when someone creates opportunity for you, take a risk on them just like they took a risk on you. And my third lesson to each and every one of you who are going to change the world is very simply, you may not go to places and be amongst people awarding yourself the saviorism of helping them. If you're gonna change the world, you're gonna do it through service. Because my service and my ability to reframe what I believe was my altruistic motivation to help people is much more powerful when I declare and realize and operationalize that I am here to serve because public service is about being a servant. And when we are servants, we're able to see very clearly that serving is an outcome of the realization that our collective destinies are all intertwined together. I had the tremendous opportunity when I worked for Mary Lynn. I received some of the highest awards that HHS gave out, including at the age of 24, I received the top nation, the top honor in the nation around maternal child health that was called the Woodville Award, was invited to the White House, and even came down here and hung out at Ship Rock and created what is the Rural Nurse Residency Program, which is a one of its kind model. I did all of that stuff because someone took a chance on me 
And because when I moved to South Dakota, I refused to live where the area office was. I lived on the Rosebud Reservation, or the Sakanju Oyate. I lived over at Pine Ridge, and I lived up at Turtle Mountain. And those communities made me a part of them. When I lived at Rosebud, elders made sure I had food. They made sure that I was not stuck in my apartment, but that I was out at the powwow that I was out going to rummage sales. See, we called them yard sales, but we were rummage selling all through South Dakota. And perhaps the greatest lesson that I learned living in the Dakotas was simply this. No matter where opportunity takes you, and no matter what path the Creator outlines for you, you may never forget the people where you came from. There was a flood that was coming. And I knew that where my people lived in North Carolina, they would not get the same help as everyone else. And I needed to get home to help our family prepare for the hurricane and to help my community. And I remember Mary Lynn saying, you are responsible for your community. And she took me to the airport and she put me on a plane and she sent me home to North Carolina. And I spent the next three days helping my family move out of the flood zone. No matter what your degrees are on your wall, what your accomplishments or how much money is ever in your bank account, when your home community needs you, an utmost responsibility is to show up. Because the dreams that your ancestors sowed for you, that harvest is as much in that community as it is anywhere else in the world. And I learned that from a woman from the three affiliated tribe and from the Standing Rock Sioux. So down here in Shiprock, right? Because Shiprock was a cool place. I don't know if I've worked off all the calories of the fried bread I ate because we ate it for like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Indian tacos on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, twice on Saturday. Now, I knew that my time at the Indian Help Service was coming to an end. And it was for a very simple reason. What I was doing needed to be done by somebody that was from that community. And my goal was to move out so Native and Indigenous nurses could move in. And they are leading those programs today. And a lady named Lavinia Diswood, she used to be the chief nurse at Shiprock. She said, Kenan, you need to go and write books and do research. You can help the Indian Health Service by advancing evidence and being a researcher. And I left Ship Rock and drove back to North Dakota and I enrolled in a doctoral program and went on to get a postdoc. And one day the ancestors and the creator illuminated my mind and I got a call from the United States Agency for International Development. And they had heard about the tremendous stuff that we had done in the Indian Health Service. And I'm gonna tell you, we did some tremendous things that changed the world, and we did them without enough resources every single day. And I was offered a scientist position to go to USAID. And Mary Lynn said, Clifton, job well done. You may go. I was presented star quilts at Turtle Mountain, at Pine Ridge, at Rosebud and Standing Rock. And I packed up my quilts and I went to Washington, D.C. And I'll tell you, I have never felt so lost going to the East Coast. Despite having been at the White House, despite having won all of these awards, I found myself in a place where everyone had went to Hopkins or to Georgetown or to Harvard or to Yale. And I began to feel very self-conscious about having went to community college. I recall a time sitting in a room where people sat and waited and someone looked at me and said, I'm glad you're here to take the notes. Dr. Keenan will be coming to facilitate this meeting and he's gonna need a note taker. They never realized that that's who I actually was because I didn't fit the billet. And I felt really sad and really lost and I called Mary Lynn and Mary Lynn said, Clifton, you deserve to be there and you are as smart as any of those people are. And she said, drive home to your home community and regain yourself and then walk boldly towards that which makes you the most uncomfortable. 
And guess what? That's what I did. Got in my truck. And I drove home to Winston-Salem State University, a school founded by people who overcame slavery. And I could feel the ancestors there. And the beautiful thing about going to an HBCU, going to a tribal college, many of the people who lived the institution opening are still alive and you can glean from those people. And there was a lady named Gwen Andrews who came to Winston-Salem State as a young black woman to start our nursing school because black nursing students were not allowed at the University of North Carolina. So we got a nursing school at Winston-Salem State. And she looked at me and she said, Kenan, I know you're not feeling sorry for yourself. Let me tell you how your ancestors overcame. I started a nursing school in an infirmary with no equipment. The local hospitals wouldn't even allow our students to come. And I refused to give up. I put young girls on buses and sent them to New York. Many had never left their communities. And when everyone else counted us out, this is the story of how we've overcome. You think your ancestors are going to hear your whining about how people aren't accepting you in a meeting room? You need to pull it together and walk back into your destiny. And I went back to USAID as a postdoc trained scientist, just as qualified as everyone else. And I led fundamental research that changed the way we look at fertility and family planning all over the world. And at the age of 33, I made history yet again. And I was inducted into the American Academy of Nursing before the age of 40, the youngest person to ever do that in my class. And I went to community college. I'm from a town where there was one traffic light. It wasn't even a stoplight. I went to HBCU and I am leading. And every opportunity that my ancestors have set up for me I am walking boldly into those things because you and I deserve to be there as much as everyone else. So no matter what your lot in life is, and I do hope that you will consider a career in public service because to serve your fellow man, to serve fellow person is the greatest honor of them all. And whatever you decide to do, make sure that you have a hero. Make sure that when you go into a room and there's nobody that looks like you, you don't celebrate that. I never want to be in a room where I'm the only African American. Never accept that being in a room where you're the only Native American is acceptable. Whenever you find yourselves in those situations, reach back and reach out and pull somebody along with you because only is not cool anymore. Bring your entire entourage with you. And as Shirley Chisholm said, famous civil rights activist, if you come to a table and there's not room for you, bring a folding chair. And I've got a folding chair that I keep in my trunk and I'm bringing it everywhere I go because I'm pulling up because I deserve to be there just like all of you. So as I conclude reaping the harvest, that my ancestors sowed for me. I want you to think long and hard about why you're needed to change this nation, your nation, this world that we live in. And I want you to do it by honoring your local heroes, never forgetting what your people have given to you. No matter how high I climb in life, if I ever climb too high to go back to my rural community and be the same as the people I left, I have lost out and I have failed. And I say that to you, whether you agree with those in your local community or whether or not, you must always honor them because opportunity for you is a blessing that they set up for you to be able to receive. I say all that to say, we're here today from the United States Agency for International Development. And I've been on every continent in the world. My research has been read worldwide and I've lectured to people in full rooms all over this world. I've been to the White House, been to the United Nations and so many other places. 
an expert in three areas at the age of 35. And I tell the story wherever I go. Community college made me who I am. Serving people set me up to be successful. And every day, talented people grow up and they are looking for a hero. Will you be the hero that somebody in your local community aspires to be? And the seeds that your ancestors sowed when they couldn't fully comprehend what the harvest may be, the harvest of TCUs, the harvest of you going on to get a doctorate degree, to become a public servant, to become a diplomat, a scientist, an entrepreneur, an artist, a poet laureate. Will your ancestors smile and sing because you are walking into the destiny that the star as the creator has aligned is illuminating for you? Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now, I got to make an announcement, right? Because I work for the government and I got to announce some government stuff. <laughs> the United States Agency for International Development is the premier world's development agency. And people just like you and I make USAID what it is. And I want to invite you today to think about how what you've been doing, what you know and what you've lived can contribute to making the world a better place through development. I hope that I can interest you in a career in development because you can come through an unorthodox path just like me. I never studied international development at all. I was birthing babies at Rosebud and Pine Ridge and I went on to do diplomacy. We are launching a $30,000 case competition for students just like you to take a issue around deforestation and gender-based violence and to pitch an idea to us. And we're gonna give teams of three or more individuals, three to six individuals, an opportunity to win $15,000, $10,000, and $5,000, and that money doesn't come with any strings. As you walk out, we will have colleagues that will have globes in their hands, and those globes will be a reminder that the world is in your hand. And I hope that you will stop and chat with them, not only about the case competition, but also about our fully funded graduate fellowship, which allows you to go to graduate school wherever you'd like, and then be guaranteed a spot into the foreign service, thereby creating a very clear path to becoming a diplomat. There's also opportunities in the civil service and other aspects of development. And I hope that you will stop by our booth and see our lovely colleagues who have presented themselves. Keep making the world a better place, make someone smile every day, and tell the story loud and proud about your people, your heritage, and why you deserve to be here. What do you think about that presentation? Lord have mercy, my brother. You can see why we selected him to be the keynote speaker for the session. And, uh, you know, there were some, some nuggets of gold there that I hope you will take with you. I think uh, the statement of walk bold into your destiny. Wow, talk about self-determination. That's what you're here for. You're shaping that real pathway. And TCUs are your vehicle. I can't think of a better vehicle uh, to, to, you know, pursue your destiny. And as uh, we've learned from, uh, you know, Clifton, uh, the, the only limitations that you will encounter are those that you agree to accept. The world will always be there. You will have naysayers, and you will have all kinds of obstacles thrown your way. You don't need to accept them. You go around them. You jump over them. You don't give up. You learn from a brother here that of what you can achieve in, by believing in yourself. Self-validation. Remember, we throw around terms like, like uh, you know, uh, self-determination. Well, a lot of that means we have to validate ourselves. We also have to reach back to our ancestors and those that, you know, have prayed for us, have, have big goals for us, and do right by them. And we need to serve our community. You are the leaders. One of the things that I, I am proud of uh, as, you know, as a TCU president, I've been with several TCUs now, is that we are preparing the future leaders of our communities. 
the future TCU presidents and provosts, faculty members, but of the community, but also the fact that you can be leaders throughout the world. I think you have seen, uh, you got a glimpse into that kind of a future that, could, that can await you. I, ha I, I can't thank you enough, sir. I can't thank you enough for the wonder. Um, let's get another round of hands for our three uh, presenters. What an amazing, wow, we are so blessed. I do have, I know we ran a little bit over time, but hey, you're here, we're here, what else matters, right? Indian time, that's all that matters, we, right? That's all that matters, that's our time. And so I do have a, a, little, a few uh, housekeeping uh, uh, comments that I, I need to uh, share with you before we uh, wrap up. I know many of you are racing out to other things that you have to attend to. Uh, number one, the AHEC Student Congress candidates for officer position videos are on the AHEC Facebook. So you can scan you know, your QR on that. Uh, registration will close today at 3 p.m. The exhibit hall will close today by 12 p.m. I want to thank the volunteers and the sponsors of this event. Um, uh, the um, Turtle Mountain uh, Community College uh, sponsored us at 25,000. We have the College of Menominee Nation, the Institute of American Indian Arts, and Tahana Atam Community College uh, were gold sponsors at 5,000. We also had the United Tribes Technical College and Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College giving us $1,000 sponsorships. Thank you, sponsors. And uh, wow, what a way. I hope that we got you off to a great Tuesday and that you are excited about what awaits you at the next annual AHEC conference. Again, a big one more round of applause to our great panel here. That's extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Clifton. Anyway, may the Lord bless you, may you continue with your journey, and may the rest of this conference be just an eye-opening, life-changing experience for you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Adios. We are more than just a college. Some say that we thrive off of challenges and failures, but we still have more room than ever to improve. In order to become the greatest of all time, we stick together and execute what needs to be done. We are more than just a college. We are a university. It begins from within. I've been here at AHEC, but I've been at my TCU for five years now. Uh, competition, I'm doing chess, archery, and happening out at the uh, powwow. We're tuning in here live at the Poetry Slam here at AHEC, live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. First Poetry Slam in AHEC Consortium since Prior to COVID, 2019 was our last one. So tonight, we got over 37 tribal colleges that are gonna be participating. Hello, my relatives, my friends. My name is Shannon Christy Hooper. I'm a Paiute Shoshone from Fallon, Nevada, and I am your current reigning Miss AHEC 2019-2023. I represent the AHEC organization, 37 tribal colleges and universities throughout the United States, including all Native American scholars.